So good morning, everybody. Today's class uh, is on basics of sustainable landscaping. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Saturday morning. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just some housekeeping items. The class will be about 45 minutes with 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, please enter your questions as they come to you. I will be answering questions at the end. Um, so Q&A questions, hit the Q&A button. If you would like to chat, send me or John a message, please uh, hit the chat bo box at the bottom. And then just a little background on who SCV Water is. We're a full service regional water agency located in the Santa Clarita Valley. We provide water to approximately 273,000 um, residents as our total population. Uh, despite the rain that we got in December, um, we are still in a drought. So we're asking everyone to continue to please to save water um, together, we can make a difference. Uh, if you have any concerns or would like to learn more about it or stay up to date on the drought, visit droughtreadyscb.com. That's where we post all of our updates. Um, so just, you know, save water and money. There's re rebate programs available to you. Uh, and you can visit conserve.urscbwater.com to see some of those rebates. Uh, super excited to announce that we do have a new and improved landscape replacement program launching March 4th, where you can earn up to $3 per square foot um, for removing your lawn. And there's other great incentives as well, uh, but all of that will be announced March 4th. So stay tuned, join us online uh, to learn more about it at our next uh, webinar. And then there are some landscape resources available to you on our website. Um, you can see our hottest plant guide, which has like the 30 best plants that thrive in the um, NCV. So pick your plants wisely. Um, and so yeah, just visit our website. There's a ton of resources for you available at SantaCruitaGardens.com and yourncvwater.com slash conservation tip. And if you have any questions, you can always email me. Uh, Water Smart Workshop, this is a great uh, resource for you. You get $20 on your uh, water bill for learning how to read your bill, how to identify leaks, and then as well as identify other common water issues. Uh, so I highly recommend this one. Um, it's $20 for you and, and you uh, get to save water. Another great program is the Smart Irrigation Controller. You can get up to $150 uh, to upgrade your irrigation system to a smart controller. Um, that, you know, $150, that's about how much they cost. So it, it's practically free and you get to save water um, and your water bill will go down as well. Um, you can control them from anywhere from, with your smartphone. And so that's a great um, tool to have available to you. Um, and we're now on Zoom. So as you can see, we've been on, on virtual for the past year and we're going to continue to be virtual this year through December, 2022. If you have any questions or concerns, um, contact me uh, at my email is lgallegos at scbwa.org um, and I'd be happy to, to chat with you. As well as if you want any like a copy of the presentation, email me after and I will get you a copy um, right after. And you can find us online uh, and connect with us. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and all of our classes are posted on YouTube after. Um, in about a week, they're posted on, on, on YouTube. So you can just type in SCV Water and you will find the classes um, from this year and last year. Um, so that's it. We have John with us today. And so he will be uh, sharing his screen and running through the presentation. So I will turn my camera off, um, but I'm still here. So let me know if you need anything. Okay, uh, welcome folks. Uh, the title is Basics of Sustainable Landscaping, but in a nutshell, what we're really gonna talk about is how to garden uh, with uh, using plants that perhaps don't need a whole lot of work, don't need a lot of trimming, don't need a lot of water, 
and a few tips on how to keep those plants alive. And we're even going to show you uh, some slides of some plants that uh, would probably fit into anybody's uh, uh, garden. Uh, we've got about oh, 10 or 12 plants we'll talk about, but uh, during the uh, earlier presentation there, uh, you saw that uh, SCV Water uh, does have uh, a list of plants. Uh, I, they have one called the Top 30 Plants for Santa Clarita Valley. And uh, that would be a very handy guide to have if you're planning on adding any more plants to your yard or doing any landscaping. Okay, so first we'll talk about what say, sustainability means. Uh, it means basically uh, the maintenance of the plants. Uh, for instance, in an existing plant, uh, how can we sustain and maintain it? And a couple of things we'll talk about are mulching, composting, various fertilizers, uh, plant, uh, plant selection and pruning, and uh, efficient irrigation. And we'll also talk about if you're doing a new or retrofitting your landscaping, things like uh, saving rainwater efficient irrigation, and the drought-tolerant plant material. So sustainable maintenance has to do with what are things that we have to constantly do to our garden uh, to keep it operational. And if we have a lawn, one of the things we have to do is mowing the lawn. And that's pretty much a weekly process. Uh, so one thing is obviously having a smaller lawn, there would be less mowing, less waste. And the other thing you can do is mulch while you mow. They uh, have attachments for lawnmowers and they also have lawnmowers that are called mulching lawnmowers. And what they'll do is they'll cut the clippings up very fine and drop them back in to the turf uh, where they actually re feed your grass again uh, because the blades that you're cutting off actually have food in them. Uh, so that's a great way to do it. Uh, raising your mower height, believe it or not, the longer you keep your lawn, the healthier it is. It'll shade the ground underneath and reduce evaporation. Uh, so setting your mower at uh, the highest setting, generally three to three and a half inches. Uh, will help to conserve water and uh, give you fewer clippings when you do prune. Now, something else we can talk about is managing soil compaction. And uh, we, we can do that with uh, tools. There are tools called aerators that will actually punch holes in your lawn and allow for air, water, and fertilizer to get down to the roots. Uh, we'll also talk a little about organic fertilizers and why we might want to use those instead of the synthetics. And uh, one of the main reasons is organic fertilizers, they break down slower. So they feed you long over a longer period of time. You don't get a sudden spike in the growth. Uh, synthetic fertilizers generally have nitrogen that releases very quickly. You see the results very quickly, but on a lawn, that simply means you're just going to have to mow again. And then we'll talk a little bit about pruning and uh, perhaps uh, choosing plants that don't need uh, to be pruned too often. So this is the mulching while you mow slide. And as you can see, this is a picture of what's called a mulching mower. And it cuts the grass clippings up very fine, drops them back in, uh, and returns the nutrients to your soil. And uh, keep in mind, uh, grass clippings are not thatch. They don't promote thatch. Uh, 
clippings are just the tips of the grass blades and uh, they're very good uh, for the lawn. They'll feed the lawn again. So some techniques are, well, one, obviously, if your mower is called a mulching mower, you don't have to do anything. It does it all for you. Sometimes you can get uh, various attachments to put on the mower uh, to mul mulch as you go. And then there's an interesting tip right there. Never cut more than one third of the grass blade. So if we're letting our lawn grow nice and tall, then we'll only be cutting off the tips. Okay, And don't mow wet grass. Uh, that'll make a mess. It also won't allow you to mulch with your mower if it's wet. And the alternate mowing pattern, you've probably seen these, uh, certainly on sports fields, etc., where they will go north and south first and then east and west again. This assures that you're uh, getting a nice even cutting on the lawn. Now, serving soil compaction, that's uh, just something that uh, we end up with. Uh, because before they can build our houses, they have to compact the soil sometimes to a depth of six or seven feet in order to have a stable building surface. So that's great for the house, but terrible for the landscape. Uh, poor water infiltration. You water and the water just sits there on top or it runs off. Uh, it, when the water does soak in, it pushes out the oxygen. So you can get an anaerobic uh, action going on there and actually uh, rot the roots of your trees and shrubs out. The roots don't develop properly in a hard soil. And the higher the soil content, the uh, worse the compaction will be. So how do we uncompact the soil? Well, a, a couple of different ways. Uh, obviously, using organic amendments mixed into the soil and mulch on top of the soil. Uh, the addition of gypsum, which can simply be broadcast over the top of your soil and then allow your sprinklers to work it in. And then tilling. Uh, certainly before you plant, before you put in a new lawn, before you put in flowers, tilling. Turn the soil over as deep as you can. Now, fortunately, most lawns, flowers, small plants, vegetables, don't have very deep root systems. So tilling to eight inches is great. If you can get deeper than that, that's great, but that would be the minimum uh, that you would want to loosen your soil up. And then add the organic amendments into your soil to help hold it open. Now, irrigation, plays a lot to do with this too. If your soil is hard, as we mentioned, the water won't penetrate. If we do a slow, deep, infrequent irrigation, the water will slowly penetrate. And the thing about clay soils or heavy soils is that they hold the moisture for a very long period of time, thus allowing us to go longer periods of time in between waterings. We don't want to keep the soil saturated. Uh, as I mentioned, water in means oxygen out and the roots of the plants need oxygen. So that is why the uh, aerifying or the, uh, the machine that will punch the holes in the soil is a good thing. And you can do that over your lawn, even after your lawn's established. Uh, it's uh, Some people do it before summer. They'll do it maybe in the springtime, uh, because when the summer hits, that's when you have the problems with your lawn, if you have compact soil and not good water penetrating. So those are called aerators, and you can rent them from rental yards, you can even buy a little handheld one and poke some holes yourself. Now, mulching and composting are 
two different things, but they're both derived from organic material. Uh, mulch can be any organic material that's laid on top of the soil to control weeds, to hold in moisture, and regulate temperature. Usually it's a woody material, uh, typically shredded bark or ground up uh, trees, ground up branches. Compost uh, can be any organic material that has in fact been decomposed. Compost is worked into the soil. Compost is what you would use when you're planting something, or if you've turned over your soil, you would add compost to it to help it open, keep it open. It'll improve the aeration, also allows the water uh, to infiltrate better. It'll help to reduce the compaction, and a nice compost uh, will feed the microorganisms that are in your soil, and as it breaks down, help, in fact, to add nutrients to your soil. So they're both typically recycled plant material, as I mentioned, green waste, tree trimmings, etc. There are other materials that are sold as mulch, but they're usually not recommended. Uh, certainly are not going to recommend them for uh, this purpose uh, because they're usually made out of rock or mineral material. And uh, we don't advise the uh, ground rubber as a mulch except in play areas. The other things, the gravel, rock, decomposed granite, might look nice in a southwest gardening. And uh, they may help with weed control and give you a, a stable surface uh, to walk on. And we will show you some examples of these things. So here you see a big pile of mulch. And basically, this has just come been dumped out of a tree trimmer's truck. They shred everything after they cut it, and the material that they shred is a wonderful mulch. And uh, it can simply be placed on top of the soil. A nice layer, maybe four inches deep, helps to reduce the weeds. As I mentioned, as it breaks down, they can add nutrients, help to reduce the amount of compaction. Wonderful for the beneficial insects, reduces erosion helps to moderate the uh, temperature of your soil. It'll actually keep it cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. And it does reduce evaporation. So once you mulch, you can water much less frequently. Now, one thing you have to know about the mulch is we don't want to mulch right up to the trunks or stems of our plants. So, depending on the size of the plant. If it's a little plant, keep the mulch six inches away. From a tree, we might go 18 inches away from the trunk. And don't mulch right up next to the uh, foundation of your house or garage or other buildings. But a nice two to four inch thick layer above the roots uh, is recommended. Out in open areas where you're not doing any planting, uh, you can go higher. You can go four to six inches uh, in height, in depth, on the uh, mulch, if you like. Now, compost, you can make your own compost or you can buy it. And what it basically is, is different organic matter uh, that's broken down or eaten and digested by soil organisms. And there's two basic ways we do this. One is the thermal process. Uh, that's where we mix a lot of organic materials together, maybe kitchen waste and yard waste, pile it up, and let the little organisms eat it, heat it up, and break it down. Uh, the other way is a called a cold process. And in this one, we use worms. We use worms to break down the organic material. And... Uh, this is a this is a twofold benefit by using the worm method, because what is broken down uh, is then what the worms eat and digest is called 
uh, worm castings, and that is just wonderful for the soil. Now, obviously, it takes a lot longer. You don't get as much uh, as you do with the, uh, the thermal composting, but it's great stuff. And you can buy the uh, worm gold or the worm compost uh, at the nursery. Again, it's excellent for everything. Uh, some people even add it to their potting soils for the house plants, certainly outside in the vegetable garden or around your roses and flowers. If you're going to make your own compost pile, uh, you may want to read up on it. And you'll find that you, to make it yourself, you'll have to have equal amounts of carbon and nitrogen products. The carbon would be anything that's brown, dried up leaves, sawdust. The nitrogen would be green products, generally green grass clippings and uh, vegetable waste from the household. So equal amounts of that. Air, so what we have to do is turn the pile over, probably weekly, in order to get enough air in there and water the pile if it begins to dry out. So now we're going to talk a little bit about fertilizing. And mostly we're going to talk about organic fertilizers because of the benefits that I mentioned before, uh, that they break down very slowly and they don't give you that sudden jolt of plant growth. And uh, so these things are made from natural materials with very little processing. And they consist of mined minerals, animal-based products and plant-based products. And these would be uh, items over here on the right, like manure, cottonseed meal, fish products of all sorts. You've probably heard of fish emulsion. That would be a liquid one. You can also buy dry fish products. Uh, they're excellent fertilizer. Oyster shells and crab shells are available. And blood meal and bone meal. Uh, are excellent natural organic fertilizers. And then kelp, kelp and alfalfa meal. Uh, these are things that uh, people that grow roses uh, add at least once a year, kelp meal and bone meal to their rose garden. A wonderful product. So the organic fertilizers, they feed over a longer period of time, as we mentioned. Uh, there's no spike of growth and labor-saving in that we don't have to use them very often. Uh, some people only feed really uh, twice a year, maybe once in early spring, once in late spring. If you're planting flowers or vegetables, you could feed again in the fall. For your lawn, it's a little different. <clears throat> uh, the organic fertilizers don't work so well when it's cold, so for your lawn, the organic fertilizers are great from spring through fall. During the winter, you may have to use a, uh, a synthetic to keep your grass green. So now we're gonna talk, we're gonna begin a little bit here on uh, plant selection. We'll talk about trees. We actually are gonna do an entire episode on just trees. Uh, so hopefully you'll tune in for that one or a catch show one. We these uh, these classes are recorded, and uh, you can dial download them to watch classes that maybe you've missed. But uh, things to consider about uh, trees are, of course, the uh, the shade. Uh, they can lower your energy bill uh, by shading your house. Uh, so the placement of the tree. To really get shade benefits from your tree, you'd be wanting to plant that tree on the west or southwest side of your yard. Planting a tree on the east side of your yard or the north side won't really give you any shade. Uh, the drawbacks to having a lot of trees are the maintenance, pruning. Uh, some trees do need to be pruned. Others can be left to their own devices. And most trees are going to drop leaves. Some deciduous trees drop all the leaves in the fall and winter. Some evergreen trees drop a few leaves 
all year long. Now, last week we talked more about pruning, uh, but pruning is an essential part of gardening. And uh, a couple of reasons that we prune, the number one reason is safety. Uh, we don't want a branch to break or fall. We don't want branches interfering with a sidewalk or a street or a driveway or a walkway. Uh, so we may have to prune uh, just for safety. Uh, some people like to train plants into desired shapes. Uh, if you've been to Disneyland, you've certainly seen that. And sometimes pruning can rejuvenate an old plant. Uh, cutting it back and allowing all new growth to come. For instance, perennials, many perennials, sages, lavenders, plants of that sort can be revived uh, by pruning. And it'll actually help to increase the, uh, the flowering. And fruit trees can be pruned every year to increase the uh, flowering and fruiting. Uh, we talked last year about, or last week, I'm sorry, uh, about opening up the center of the plant to letting in more light. And uh, here's a little slide to show you what that means. So this is before and this is after. And you can see uh, light and air will get in there. And uh, this is very important for all trees, uh, not just fruit trees. But... Uh, Sunlight is what helps to ripen up fruit. So if our tree is nice and airy like this, our fruit will ripen. Now, irrigation, once again, we'll do an entire presentation on just irrigation. But for the purposes of this class, um, we're going to ask that you consider improving your irrigation efficiency any way you can. And sometimes that might be by using drip in certain portions of your yard. If your shrubs are far apart, a drip might be an efficient way of watering rather than watering an entire area. You can simply water where the roots of the plant are. Uh, high efficiency sprays. Nowadays, most of the spray manufacturers have manufactured sprinklers that are much more efficient than the old fashioned type uh, in the slide here, you see a stream spray. Well, a stream spray is much more efficient than a fan spray. There's less evaporation, larger drops of water. Uh, the other thing you can do is by changing out your sprinkler heads is you can eliminate overspray. If you only need the sprinkler to go eight feet, you can actually buy a sprinkler head that will only shoot eight feet. Instead of having a 15 footer there that maybe hits the driveway and hits the car or runs out in the street. The other thing you can do is by buying a sprinkler head that is designed for the area, you won't have as much misting because you won't have to adjust the sprinklers down. And uh, the misting, of course, just turns right into evaporation. And by adjusting your sprinklers to the area, uh, you won't have as much runoff. Uh, you may have to run your sprinklers a little longer or do multiple starts. In other words, you may have to run your sprinklers at 6 a.m. and again at 7 a.m. to get the water to penetrate if you have that hard, compact soil we were talking about. Now, this is something that they're doing on new homes. Pretty much every new home in Southern California now uh, is built with the thought in mind that they want to maintain as much rain water as possible onto the property. So they develop these swales or these low spots in the yard to collect as much rain water as possible so that it can go down into the ground and back into the aquifers. You know that back in the uh, 50s and 60s, the uh, main attitude was to get that rain water off the property as fast as possible send it down into the storm drains and send it out to the LA River and eventually down to the ocean. Uh, well, that practice was foolhardy because we didn't allow the water to 
penetrate. We didn't allow the water to soak in and go back and become gro groundwater again. So uh, that practice is frowned upon now. And so they are uh, doing these swales and these low spots, these indentations in the yard to collect the rainwater. And when, they, when that area is full, uh, then there is a uh, area for it to escape out. Uh, but this is something that you can do on your property simply by having a, uh, a low spot in the yard and having all the drainage run that way. Uh, and no, you can't drain it onto your uh, neighbor's yard. That is uh, frowned upon. So here's a picture of what we were talking about, these uh, so-called rain gardens. And what they are is they're low spots, and everything in the yard will drain into these spots. The water from your uh, gutters, uh, etc., uh, can be directed this in this this uh, these areas, and they don't have to be very deep, as you see, four inches to a foot deep, and you can put all kinds of or of drought tolerant plants in there. And this is an instance where we will use the rock mulches that we talked about, the gravel, the decorative rocks, some boulders, etc. This is the one area in the yard that we wouldn't want to use the organic mulches uh, because the wood would then float up. Uh, and it is nice to have an overflow provision. In other words, once these areas fill up, it would be nice to have the water uh, move on uh, if needed. Now, another way uh, to conserve water is with container gardens. And container gardens can be quite beautiful, and we can water them by hand if we so desire, or we can run irrigation, drip irrigation up into the pots. And then we're watering, putting water only where the plants are. Uh, it's a fantastic idea, and if you have a lot of pots in the yard uh, and you don't have the time or the inclination to go out and hand water them, a, a drip system uh, will be able to take care of that for you. And the drip system can run off your basic sprinkler system, or you can buy a timer that connects to a garden hose, and then you can set the timer to water your pots as needed. Now, these are very popular now. Raised beds and planters. Uh, most of the time they're used for vegetable gardening. But you can also mix flowers in with them. And uh, these work quite well. And uh, you can see that in this particular one, if you look closely, you'll see that they've actually put some mulch in there around their vegetables and on the ground. They have rocks and uh, gravel and some flowers. So uh, raised beds are a wonderful way to uh, conserve water because, once again, you're only putting the water where the plants are. And this can be done with soaker systems, drip systems. Even uh, some standard irrigation systems can work well for your raised beds. Uh, but uh, these are very popular and just a wonderful way to garden. Now, let's talk a little bit about some plant characteristics of drought-tolerant plants. Uh, one reason they are drought-tolerant is they have excellent stomatic control. What that means is they can control their evaporation and transpiration uh, quite well. Uh, this is usually done uh, by having a smaller leaf and a waxy leaf surface. Uh, now, these types of plants can absorb water usually very quickly. They have an efficient root system, usually a large root system, a surface root system that can absorb the water readily and then hold on to it for a long period of time. Uh, that's what makes them drought tolerant. We also have plants that can do the same thing that are drought tolerant. And Generally, drought-tolerant plants do quite well here in Santa Clarita. Some things that they have to deal with are the wind, and uh, certainly we get that a lot. Intense sun 
we have uh, we have that low humidity and hot summers uh, summers with temperatures that reach over 100 degrees and the last couple of summers we've reached over 110 and cold winters uh, we still do get freezing temperatures here we have heavy soils sometimes clay soils uh, but on the plus side we do have good water quality so now we're going to talk a little bit about some of those plants that can deal with everything we just talked about. They can deal with the wind. They can deal with the heat. They can deal with reduced watering. And the first few we're going to talk about are plants that are not only great landscape plants, but uh, they might serve a double, serve, uh, double purpose. And uh, the number one plant there, the pineapple guava, beautiful tree beautiful green leaves. It can have a single or multi-trunk. It produces a fruit that is edible. In fact, it produces a flower that is edible. So not only is it an attractive landscape plant, uh, but I know in, in my yard, I say, well, if I'm gonna water a plant, I certainly wanna get something from it. And uh, food would be one of those things that I would wanna get from the plant. So the pineapple guava is an excellent plant. Another one is the pomegranate. Now you'd be surprised how easy it is to grow a pomegranate. Once again, all those things we talked about, loving the sun, loving the heat, not caring about the soil, takes the wind, needs very little water, very little care, very little pruning. And of course, gives you a beautiful flower and an edible fruit. Uh, that is uh, delicious and nutritious. Now we're going to talk about some smaller plants. Once again, landscape plants with uh, more than one use. Uh, one that we can talk about is rosemary. Rosemary ex makes an excellent ground cover. It takes the heat, the wind, the sun, the drought. It loves hot, sunny areas. It is a very tough plant. And yes, you can uh, use it for uh, uh, as an herb for baking. Some people I know like to take a sprig of the uh, rosemary and put it in their olive oil. Uh, I've used the rosemary on baked potatoes. I'll take a baked potato, cut it in half, uh, put some rosemary and maybe some sage in there, wrap it in foil and throw it on the barbecue. Uh, lavender, who doesn't love lavender? Lavender is a wonderful plant with many, many uses, and yet it is tough as nails. Uh, all those things we talked about, the full sun, the heat, uh, wind, it puts up with all those things. It uh, doesn't need any fertilizer, needs only moderate amounts of water. Uh, you can prune it back several times a year to keep it bushy. And uh, you can make potpourri and sachets from it, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, here's the garden sage. And as I mentioned, this is one of the plants that uh, you can cook with, use it in your baked potatoes and many different varieties of sage. The one that is often used for cooking is the variety called officinalis. Uh, but it's uh, just a wonderful, beautiful landscape plant in the yard. Produces flowers and uh, edible leaves. So those three plants are plants that if you have a hot sunny spot in the yard, these three plants would, uh, would foot the bill for that. What they can't tolerate, they can't tolerate a shade constantly moistened soils or really rich soils. They don't want it to grow in an area of your yard that you're constantly fertilizing and watering. They don't need it and don't want it. Uh, here's a little ground cover plant called chamomile. You can use this in between stepping stones. There's two different varieties of chamomile. One that grows very low, can be used in rock gardens or between stepping stones. And then another one, uh, that grows a little taller uh, that they use for the tea. And the leaves smell delicious. So if you're 
dogs go out running through the chamomile, they'll come back into the house smelling delightful. Germander is another herb uh, used in cooking. It uh, produces a beautiful little purple flower. So it makes a great ground cover, once again, great in rock gardens and has all the benefits we've talked about. The uh, small, hard green leaf that's very attractive all year round. It does produce a purple flower, but its uh, main uh, interest is just how attractive it stays year round and compact. And then oregano. Uh, oregano is a wonderful landscape plant. Of course, it has uh, uses in the kitchen, but it is tougher than you might think. It does do well in containers. Uh, for your container garden or your raised beds, it'll do great in there. Uh, also a nice plant to put in the uh, drought tolerant garden. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about plants that will attract beneficial insects to your garden. And uh, by having beneficial insects, they will help to control some of the uh, negative insects uh, that may infiltrate our garden from time to time. So this is a partial list of plants that will attract beneficial insects. But I just wanna draw your attention to that first row there. Some plants that you maybe didn't think about that you may be growing in your garden now, like cilantro and dill. Those two plants, if you, if you maybe didn't get to harvest them all in time and they go to seed, when the cilantro and the dill and the fennel go to seed, they're really no longer good for eating. They're no longer edible to us. But it's at that point that they attract the beneficial insects. I know in my own uh, yard, sometimes I don't get to use all of the cilantro in time and it will bolt or go to seed. And I'm okay with that uh, because I know that uh, it will then be attracting the uh, beneficial insects. So that first little list there, those are, those are some of the best ones right there. And then you might also want to consider attracting uh, some other types of insects to your yard, like perhaps uh, butterflies. Uh, we have a bunch of different plants that will attract butterflies to the yard, uh, including, of course, the milkweed and the cosmos and the echinacea, uh, lantanas. Uh, there's a whole list of them. And then we have a whole list of plants here that will attract hummingbirds. And everybody likes to have hummingbirds in the yard. And most varieties of salvia, especially the salvia gregei, uh, will attract hummingbirds to your yard, uh, as well as other uh, important pollinators, uh, like uh, bumblebees, etc., uh, that we actually uh, need for pollinization on some bigger plants. And this little slide just shows us some of the good guys and what they do. Some of them you're probably familiar with, the ladybugs. Uh, it's nice to attract ladybugs to your garden. You can also buy them at the nursery and release them in your yard to uh, eat some of the uh, aphids and other bad guys. There's uh, lace wings. You can also buy them and uh, release them in your yard. Uh, and once again, they'll eat a lot of the bad guys and they don't do any harm to your plants. Uh, so you can see here that this is a Cosmo flower and it's attracting some of the good guys uh, to the garden. And uh, that's what we want to do. Now praying mantid, I think the uh, jury's still out on whether the praying mantid is a, a beneficial insect. He's certainly a predator. He certainly eats darn near anything that comes his way. And uh, they're a lot of fun to watch if you've never watched a praying mantid uh, in action. Okay, now we're gonna get to the Q&A portion of this. 
And I believe that there's a area for you to uh, type your questions in. And uh, you can do this at any time. The ones that are already in the system that you've already typed in now, Laura will read off to me and uh, I will attempt to answer them uh, as best as possible. If you're doing this at a later date after the presentation has stopped, uh, Laura will forward the questions to me and I will get the answers back to her and uh, we will answer any questions you have. All right, Laura. Okay, John. So you do have a question. Uh, it says, what do you think of rainwater collection tanks? Uh, I use them. I use uh, I use uh, rain barrels. Uh, they're excellent because the rainwater is so pure and clean. Uh, I've even washed my hair with it. Uh, it, it. The only thing I would say about that is all of the every rain barrel I've ever seen does come equipped with a screen or screening mechanism uh, to keep uh, mosquitoes out. Here in Santa Clarita, um, it's a perfect climate for the uh, mosquitoes in the summer. So I th just make sure your rain barrel is equipped with a, a screen to keep mosquitoes out. Okay. Okay. Uh, somebody said, best place to buy edible plants? A green thumb nursery, uh, far and away. Uh, the selection of edible plants is greater at that nursery than uh, any other nursery I've seen. And uh, you can buy seeds or you can buy the started plants already. Uh, you can buy any of the plants that we've discussed in the program here. The herbs, sages, uh, pomegranate, uh, all of them, fruit trees, etc. Okay, next question is, um, I have inherited orchids. When do they bloom and what do you recommend as far as keeping them indoors or outdoors? Uh, here in Santa Clarita, we have to keep them indoors. Uh, you might be able to take them out in the spring and put them in the shade, uh, but it's just way too cold for them. If the temperatures are going to be below 50 at night, that is unacceptable uh, for an orchid. Their typical blooming uh, period begins, now this is typically, uh, February, March, April. Uh, that's when they would typically bloom. If you can put them in a bright location in the house and uh, be patient with them, uh, they they should bloom for you. If uh, if you have it for more than a year and it doesn't bloom, uh, then then talk to us. We'll give you some tips. Okay. Okay. Somebody said, uh, when is the city of Santa Clarita going to get on board with native landscaping? Oh, they, they are. If you see that, uh, that list, that top 30 list that they have, uh, there's a lot of natives on there. But uh, let me just point something out, that there are a lot of plants that come from different parts of the world that have the same sort of climate as us, like South Africa, Australia, and the Mediterranean region. Um, and some of these plants are as good as any native plant in doing what we want. For instance, one of our favorite plants out here is the Arbutus unito, or the strawberry tree. Well, there is a variety of Arbutus that is native to the hills here. It's simply a little bit fussy. Doesn't like to be transplanted. Isn't quite as attractive as the Arbutus that comes from the Mediterranean region. So I have no problem recommending the Arbutus unito over the native Arbutus. And that's true with uh, uh, many plants. They may be in the same genus as some of our natives, but they may perform a little better they may transplant more readily. They may be hardier. Uh, we do have a problem with native plants. Uh, some of us have a problem with them and that we might overwater them. And keep in mind the native plants are used to going without any water in the summer. They're used to going all summer long without a drop of rain. There aren't too many of us that will let our yards go 
all summer long without any water. So uh, yet there might be some plants related to our natives that can adapt to it, that can take the, uh, the water if, if they get it. Uh, certainly all the plants that we've talked about in this presentation uh, have all the benefits we're looking for. While it's true that none are true natives, none are indigenous to Santa Clarita. Okay, go ahead. Okay, next question is irrigation times for small uh, size lawns. Oh, yeah, the, uh, during the warm months, the uh, best time to irrigate is between 6 and 8 a.m. Uh, during the cold months, you can move that up to between 8 and 10 a.m. Uh, so it's always in the morning and it's always just before the sun comes up. Uh, when it's cold, we could get frost and we don't want our sprinklers to freeze. So we wait until the sun is already up. And that's why I say between in the winter, between eight and 10, but in the summer, between six and eight. Okay. Okay. Um, somebody said, I am training to do compost from kitchen scraps. What is the best way to do that? I leave them in my yard to certain spot but that attracts bugs. Um, yeah, then your kitchen scraps, are, as, as I mentioned, are mostly going to be the greens. You have to add some brown material to that. Uh, that can be dried leaves. Uh, it can be uh, wood chips. It can be sawdust. Uh, but if you mix those things together, uh, the browns with the greens, uh, it won't be so attractive to uh, nuisances. Uh, some of the bugs that it attracts, you know, pill bugs, stuff like that, are just helping to break it down. Uh, that's not so much of a problem. Uh, and every time you add a little green material to that pile, make sure you're adding a little brown to it and turn it over to aerate it uh, and let it break down. And you can always buy products called compost starters that already contain some broken down compost with some natural food and you can put that in your compost pile and it'll speed up the decomposition you won't get any insects or bugs once it starts to heat up it gets too hot uh, for uh, bugs or insects okay uh what are the best edible plants to grow indoors Ugh. It's really tough. If you have a really bright window, uh, you might be able to grow things like basil, possibly mint. All these things would have to be in pots near a very bright window. Uh, unfortunately, edibles just don't do all that well indoors. Outside in pots, uh, they do quite well. But indoors, you're very limited. I have known some people that have done fair with basil. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry, it's just not a very long list. Okay, next. Okay, somebody said, I live in Agua Dulce and have terrible problems with gophers destroying many yes. things I plant. Any suggestions yeah. other than putting wire mesh around the root system? Thank you. Yes, uh, eliminate the gophers, trap them, trap them. Uh, there are baits. Uh, yeah, I, I have no patience with gophers. All they want to do is eat the plants that we put in the ground. If they just ate weeds, I would encourage them, but they don't. They eat fruit trees, they eat our vegetables, they eat our roses. Uh, I have no problem with eradicating gophers any way possible, period. Okay. Um, to plant the edible landscaping plants like oregano, lavender, and sage, do you recommend planting them from seeds or buying them at the store and planting each one? Oh, that's entirely up to you, uh, depending on how patient you are. I will tell you this, unless you want a whole bunch of oregano or a whole bunch of lavender, um, I would plant the individual plants. Uh, seeds of even a small package of seeds is probably going to give you 25, 30 plants, uh, which I guess is fine. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's totally up to you. I don't have a preference there. Whenever I've planted the herbs, the rosemary, the lavender, the germander, the oregano, I've always found the smallest pot I could find in the nursery 
and planted that. Okay. Okay, somebody said recommendations for learning how to garden and develop a green thumb. Well, you know, there was a wonderful resource, the Sunset Western Garden Book, that is unfortunately out of print. But if you could ever find a Sunset Western Garden Book at a garage sale or online, it is a wonderful resource. And it's been around a very long time. Uh, uh, the entire time that I went to school, I studied this for 10 years. Um, we always use the Sunset Western Garden book as a guide. And it's a wonderful, wonderful resource. Uh, there's also wonderful information from the uh, Santa Clarita Valley Water Agency. Uh, they have a lot of resources there too. Uh, I've always liked books. And uh, so uh, I would say the number one resource would be a nice book on gardening. Okay, go ahead. Okay, what plants do you recommend by the side of the fence combining edible plants with ornamentals? Oh, well, uh, if it's, it depends on the location. If it's morning sun, say sun from 6 a.m. till 1 o'clock, uh, blueberries, believe it or not. Blueberries uh, prefer sunlight in the morning. They don't like that hot afternoon sun, but they do have to have some sunlight. Uh, and blueberries can get pretty tall. There are varieties that'll get three feet or five feet tall. Uh, for fun, uh, you can grow uh, during the warmer months. Uh, passion fruit, the passion vine. Uh, that's kind of a fun plant. Then if you have an area that is very sunny and actually windy, windy is good, wind and sun, uh, you can grow grapes. Uh, you can grow perhaps uh, blackberries or raspberries. Uh, those would be some edibles uh, that are upright. Okay. Uh, somebody said we have a big backyard with sunlight all around throughout the day. I am having a hard time figuring out where to plant my rosemary. It is still in the pot. Oh, well, once again, the hottest, sunniest spot in the yard. Uh, it, you know, I've, they grow rosemary on hot, dry hillsides. So uh, if you don't have a lot of sun, that could be a problem. Uh, if there's something you could prune back in the yard to get more sun to an area, that'd be great. But if you've got a nice sunny area, that's where to put it. Okay. Somebody said, would now be a good time to plant the edible herbs you mentioned? Uh, rosemary, lavender, and sages, oregano, germander, these are all perennials. They're year round. So they are plants that you'll have year round, regardless of winter, spring, or summer. Some herbs like basil, cilantro, parsley, etc., should not be planted yet. I'll wait till April to plant those. They are annuals and they are um, not very tolerant of the cold weather, okay? Okay, somebody said, can I mix my lavender, sage, and rosemary all in one area? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yes. It's a wonderful combination, and, and I've seen it many times. Uh, you can buy rosemary that will grow to different heights, so maybe a rosemary could be a very low plant. Uh, some sages will get quite tall, uh, three feet, four feet. And uh, same with lavenders. You get lavenders in different heights. So yes, they, they are wonderful companion plants. Okay. Uh, and then when is the best time to plant brunuculus? Brunoculus. It's a bulb. Yeah, that's a bulb. Uh, the brunoculus is available in fall, late fall. Uh, so you would put it in the ground then, and it would come up in the springtime, it would uh, be blooming in probably March, April, into May. It stops as soon as it gets really hot. 
Uh, so it's a great spring bloomer, but the bulbs are available in the fall. The plants, uh, you could plant them as soon as the nursery has them, if you wanted to start starting plants. Okay, Samantha, what do you think about miner's lettuce? That's, uh, uh, I've eaten it hundreds of times. Uh, I like to go hiking up in the hills uh, after a rain uh, and uh, pick the miner's lettuce and eat it. Uh, I have no experience with growing it in a garden and I've only seen it growing wild and typically in cool, moist, shady locations. Okay, uh, John, somebody said, what was the name of, of the book that you mentioned earlier? The Sunset Western Garden Book. So once again, it is out of print, but you could find an old copy. Okay, um, somebody said, I have an empty plot of land. Should I plant my miner's lettuce there or can I mix it with perennials as well? It needs a lot of moisture and shade. Um, so I'm not sure it's gonna grow with your drought tolerant plants out in the full sun with a lot of heat. Uh, it might be better in a cooler, moister area. Somebody said, where can I buy them? I can't find seeds for miner's lettuce. No, nor, nor can I. I've never found it. Uh, like I say, the only, time I've ever seen it is up in the hills. Uh, I know a couple of nice hiking places where there's creeks and streams that run through and the miner's lettuce grows uh, grows there after it uh, rains. But I'm not going to tell you where those places are. Um, okay, and then what would you recommend to somebody who uh, has gotten into trouble with the city over their native landscaping? Uh, I'm not sure I'm the person to talk to. I, I think I would talk to somebody uh, at the city. But they're very nice people. I've, I, I've met many of them and the, the wonderful folks, they'll, uh, they'll help you uh, any way they can. Uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not affiliated with the city. So I'm not sure I can give you a, a better answer than that. Thank you. Okay, so that's pretty much all the questions we had. Uh, okay, one more question. Do you have any recommendations where to buy wood for planter boxes? Well, I know the Green Thumb sells planter boxes already made and they're made out of uh, natural redwood. Uh, there's no chemicals added, it's all natural. If you're gonna make your own, I would suggest uh, that you go to a lumber yard and buy redwood or cedar and uh, make your boxes from, from that. Uh, the only reason that redwood or cedar are typically used is they don't break down as fast. Any wood is fine. There's no wood on earth that, that would be, that you couldn't or shouldn't use. It's just that redwood and cedar hold up longer. So, uh, for instance, we have some redwood boxes and some redwood raised beds uh, that should hold up just uh, fine because it's all natural native wood. Okay. Okay, and then just a follow-up comment. Somebody said that there is a new edition of the Sunset Western Garden book, just so you know. Oh, well, this is news. Wow. If that's true, I'm going to have to go online and check that out. Uh, because uh, last we'd heard they'd stopped about, uh, oh gosh, six, seven years ago. Um, so if they've come out with a new edition, that is the best news I've heard all morning. <laughs> all right, thank you. Okay, so that's all our questions for today. Uh, I just want to invite everybody or thank everybody for joining us this morning. Um, and then I invite you to join us for our next class. Um, the topic is designing a sustainable landscape on March 5th at 9 a.m. So in exactly one month, I hope to see you again. Thank you for your time and thank you, John, for everything. All right, thank you, Laura, and thank you folks for watching. Have a good one.